Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Podden My Noggin. Today, we are joined by a guest, Alyssa McGrew. Did I say it right? You did. You did. Perfect. Well, thank you, (laughs) Alyssa, for being here and being a guest on Podden My Noggin. Oh, you are so welcome. It's absolutely a privilege to be here. Wonderful. So I loved reading what you sent over to me. Um, And I'll clarify myself. I didn't love like the first part of what you sent over (laughs) to me, but I loved what you were able to do with that. And so let's probably start off and sort of introduce like who Alyssa is. Um, for everybody that's listening or watching at home. All right. Well, I, um, I live in Texas. I'm a mom of five. Um, I've been kind of a serial entrepreneur my entire life. Always had something going on. I think it's kind of in my blood to run my own business and do my own thing. Um, and I grew up in a very conservative evangelical home, um, which in some ways created more challenges as you'll hear about as we get into my story here. Um, But I I exited after 18 years, an abusive, emotionally abusive marriage. And um, that experience being almost half of my life has really defined who I am in many ways. And being now on the other side, I I am in a position to begin sharing my story with people and to help other women, especially, but also men who find themselves in similar situations. So I'm really, I'm loving life again, and I'm excited to be on the other side of of a really dark time i love the fact that you're saying the other side and i think that there's we will get into it for everyone listening but like i think that there's so many people out there in the world who are so innately stuck that they don't believe that anything else could exist in their lives yes and so i find that your messaging is like just and a, a good reminder that there are other sides to every life. Like if you're not happy where you are right now, you can make steps to change them. Absolutely. So let's talk back first. You grew up in an inv- evangel. Um, oh, I can't speak. Evangel. Oh, Evangelical. Wow. Thank you <laughs> okay. so much. Thank you so it's a big much. Word. Okay. Um, well, but it's a big word, but it's one I'm very familiar with myself. Um, and so in, you're, were you, are you a PK? Yes, actually, I am. You are a PK. That's <laughs> I am. interesting. So I too am a PK um, from uh, the province of Newfoundland in Canada. So it's just a small sort of province off the coast of Canada. And uh, so interesting. So you grew up in being a PK, which, oh, for people listening, PK is just preacher's kid, pastor's kid. Uh, so that's, and what denomination? Um, my dad pastored in the Assemblies of God growing up, but we were in the state of Illinois, kind of all over the place, but several the different Assemblies churches. The Assemblies of God is Pentecostal, no? It is. Yes. That's, so this is really weird because my parents were also, also Pentecostal. <laughs> creature, so. And for the record, we had no idea that we had that in common before we started recording. Yes, this is so interesting. This was not discussed or shared on the form. So, uh, uh, so wow. Okay, so Pentecostal preachers growing up. So, like, I feel like I get you already without even knowing <laughs> you, right? Like, so, yes, that can definitely be challenging growing up in that environment. And how did, was your, so we're going to talk about your marriage and how did the Pentecostal faith play into you, say, meeting your husband and then the 18 years of staying with your husband? Oh, that's a great question. It, it, it played in, in so many ways. And many of them I'm just unpacking now being on the other side, because when you're in that and you have certain beliefs, you don't even realize sometimes what beliefs you have or that there's an alternative mm-hmm. perspective to those beliefs. So I grew up, um, I was in high school in the 1990s, right in the middle of purity culture and true love weights and I kiss dating goodbye and all of that. Um, and for anyone unfamiliar, just do a quick search for for purity culture and you'll, you'll, you'll get a whole earful on what I'm talking about. But the primary teaching that I heard over and over through high school was 
that you can't trust your heart. Like your heart will lead you astray. You can't choose a spouse based on emotion. You have to choose a spouse based on facts. And, um, and as a teenage girl in these youth groups and at these um, conventions and conferences, and it, it, it was a whole thing, what was taught over and over again was to make a checklist of all of the things that you want in a future partner. And that way, when you're in a relationship and all these emotions are welling up and, and, uh, you know, you're, you're all wrapped up in how wonderful this person is, you always have that checklist to look back on and keep yourself grounded. And that's how you know if this is a person that you should. And so coupled with that teaching, there was also this very strong idea that we do not get divorced. We don't divorce is never an option, no matter what. It's this great big sin and we don't get divorced. So all of that kind of really set me up for this scenario where I was in a relationship with this man that I ended up marrying. And even though in my gut, I had all of these red flags, I could feel in in my body that something was not right in this relationship what I did was I kept going back to my checklist and I was like, well, he's a Christian. He has a steady job. He, um, has, he says all the right things about being a good father. He, he knows the Bible. He, this, he, that he, you know, and I kept going back to that. Well, well, he meets all the things on my checklist. So it's going to be fine. It's going to work itself out. And with this teaching that you can't trust your heart, it led me to really override everything that my intuition was telling me, everything that those gut feelings were telling me, and just choose to overlook all that and focus on that checklist, because that was what I had been taught was important. And so um, then when I got married, and I started seeing what life was actually like, that teaching about we don't get divorced, divorce is a sin, divorce is never an option. That kicked in and all of a sudden I'm in this situation where I just feel completely and utterly stuck. And so that, like I said, has taken years to kind of unravel. Of course. So like call out to anybody listening. The church probably didn't use the term partner. No. Yes. No, they didn't. (laughs) When you said it, I had a little giggle because I'm like, nope, that wasn't you probably. Uh, But like, (laughs) You know, no, they said husband in my in my case. Yes, um, right. So. Um, and now, so I find this slightly interesting too because the divorce, the divorce rule rings very true to me, like in in my upbringing. And now I was a, a dude growing up, so I don't I don't recall any like lists that I had to make. Right. Mm -hmm. But I can't speak for women that were growing up in my church at that time. Like if this was something encouraged for them or whatnot. All I remember about that time is that we had to be so certain that this was the person. Because if you made those vows to that person, Mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. Right. Like now question for you, because I want to ask you some other questions about like, your intuition, like what, before you got married, but have you noticed since this time, the assemblies of God have like slackened a little bit on their divorce? I honestly, I couldn't tell you. Um, I haven't been to an assemblies of God church since I graduated high school. Fair. So I'm not really sure. Okay. Where and they fair. stand on that. In the PAON, which is the Pentecostal. Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland and the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. The teaching that divorce is a sin has like lessened slightly. And this is the call out here is if someone's being abused or there are physical representations or um, adultery or things like that, then uh, a woman or a husband has the ability to be divorced. And where it still remains sticky is that some pastors won't marry divorced people. Mm. Right? 
Yeah. So it's like you could leave and you're forgiven because of the situation. But like, if you want to go and like marry somebody else, like, nope. Yeah. You're happen. still penalized for life. <laughs> exactly. So I do know that with, with the, uh, the people that I'm directly connected to there, there's room there and it's about your walk with God really that determines, you know, if you can get remarried as a divorcee. When you were dating this gentleman, using that word loosely, I think, um, dating this person, this man, and you said that you had gut feelings of red flags. Talk about that. Like, what, what was firing off for you? Well, some of it is kind of intangible. Like, some of it was just that feeling you know one of the things that my therapist said to me in in this last i don't know year and a half (laughs) that i've been uh, seeing her she said your body sometimes knows things that your mind doesn't know and in many in many ways i think that's what was happening back when we were dating when i was with him i didn't feel peaceful i didn't feel relaxed. I didn't feel, I always felt on edge a little bit and I didn't have the language to understand that that was a big deal. I just figured, well, we're dating and this is new and you know, whatever. But I have since learned that, and especially in looking at other relationships in my life, most of the people in my life, I feel very safe with. I feel very at peace with, I feel very calm when I'm with them. And in contrast to that, I never felt that way with him, but I didn't have the language to articulate that and to understand what was happening. But there were a few more real tangible things looking back that I was like, oh, one of them is that I never, ever in 20 plus years of knowing him have ever gotten a real apology for anything. And even back when we were dating, it was, I'm sorry you felt that way. Or uh, I'm sorry if you didn't like that. <laughs> or I'm sorry. like, all those pseudo apologies that people tend to give. And that should have been a much bigger red flag for me than it was. Because when you're in a dating relationship, if the other person can't take responsibility for their BS, huge it's problem. It's the accountability piece. Yes. Right. So it's like, yes. you had an experience, but he's always then putting it back on you saying that, you know, that was your perception of the experience which in a weird way and i will not to get wires crossed this is true our perception is our experience versus another person's but a person has to be able to see their contribution right right what were Mm -hmm. their actions or words that even elicited your response to that and so him not taking accountability. Yeah. yeah. It's subtle sometimes. There's a very fine line between I'm sorry if you felt that way mm-hmm. and I'm sorry my words hurt you. But those are really two different statements. They are very different statements because one's pointed and the other one's reflective. Exactly. So you had the gut feelings. You, you didn't feel safe. And I think this is a really big call out, right? Like you're you're absolutely correct in I feel like we're also in the same age group just as an FYI just based on some of the things you said I'm 42 you don't have to share your name uh, your age we're we're the same age you're an 81 baby I am yes this is so interesting um so I also want to now ask you are you a cancer I you know what I don't know honestly I've never I've never looked I was born in June late June 14th Right in the middle. July 2nd. So we're like two weeks apart in age. Yeah. It's, it, this is nice. Um, so I'm really enjoying that. So for people listening at home and watching, one of my areas of focus with this show is feminism, right? And, and power, empowering women as well. If your gut is telling you something, you need to pause and listen. Yes. Because that absolutely. is your divine intuition. Mm-hmm. And I love that your therapist pointed out also that sometimes our gut knows things that our brains don't. And I did a podcast with a man named Billy Emery, 
and he was explaining the gut brain system because there's the gut Mm -hmm. brain, your heart, and then your brain brain, right? And our gut brain is far more smarter than our brain brain. Um, And really interesting podcast um, or conversation. So despite your red flags and your experiences, you so did he ask you to marry him? He did. He did. So it was traditional? Um, yeah, I don't actually, I guess there, there was a kind of informal moment where he proposed. Um, there was no big to do. And really, it's interesting because there really was no big, there were no big gestures about anything, which probably should have been another red flag for me that he just kind of came into this relationship assuming an outcome and assuming how I felt about things. And, you know, it was sort of a, he just kind of took everything as this is what we're doing next. And I just went along with that instead of making him work for it a little bit, which I probably should have done. Uh, But yes, there was a moment when he proposed, um, he gave me a ring out of a gumball machine or something. And, uh, and then we were planning a wedding. So we got married, uh, in 19, no, 2004, got married in 2004. And, you know, even the morning of the wedding, I still had reservations and I was still talking myself into actually going through with it. And, uh, and walking down the aisle, but I did. Did you share um, this? With, I'm just curious. Did you share this with anybody no. close to you, your reservations? No. Okay. No, I didn't. I think because I didn't want to be talked out of it, I knew how easy it would be to talk me out of it. And, you know, from from a, a woman's perspective, when you're getting ready for your wedding on your wedding day, there is so much pressure to follow through at that point. So many expectations, so much money invested. You know, it's it's just almost a done deal at that point it well it, it's almost a done deal the second you announce it really and people start making any sort of plans or booking tickets or whatnot like my sister was recently married and like you know six months prior it's i mean not that she was gonna back out of it or anything it was just like i was very integral in planning her wedding uh, mm-hmm. it was one of those things like okay, we have all this people that book tickets from all over the country to come back to Newfoundland. Like this is paid for that's paid for all. Like if something were to happen and they were decide to say not proceed, like I had that thought. I'm like, Oh geez. Like that would be like a lot to have to tell people like this isn't happening. Sorry about the money that you've invested. So the pressures I wasn't, I didn't get married. I'm single, but the pressure is immense. I can, I can agree with you there. that. Well, isn't that the craziest thing, though, when you really break down what you're saying there? Because what you're really saying is the cost of someone else's plane ticket is more important than the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. It, it, or my, absolutely. The, my happiness for the next who knows how long. And I don't know why we do that, but we do that. I think a lot of it is cultural pressure, but yeah. we we buy into that and and looking back on it, I'm like, that was the stupidest thing. Like I gave up two decades of my life because I didn't want to inconvenience other people. And absolutely, man, when I think about it that way now, I'm like, that was insane. <laughs> insane. But I think like my gut reaction is to tell you to be kind to you, right? Yeah. Different times. Yeah. And you are out of it and on the other side as we've discussed but like at that time there's even not just the money spent and people coming and all that stuff but like you're a young woman getting married there's so many variables that are unseen like levels that you're not thinking about people are also not thinking about so absolutely and we don't we don't know what we don't know Right. But exactly. I would just say to that woman who's in that situation and there's this wedding is looming and she feels like she can't get out of it. I would say, yes, yes, you can. Oh, and it's, agree, it will be yeah. OK. You know, if if you are standing at the in the foyer getting ready to walk down that aisle and you have reservations, pay attention. It's not too late. Absolutely. And I feel like if you're if it's. 
because everyone gets a bit of cold feet, right? I think that that's a normal part of marriage because it is a lifelong commitment. I'm air quoting this, but like lifelong commitment. I think everyone gets married with the ideology that it's going to be a lifelong commitment. So to have nerves and cold feet like leading up to the wedding, I think that that's very normal. But if your intuition is telling you and screaming and and it's like <laughs> you're you're shaking with like anticipation, there might be something there. And right. find your best friend, find someone you know is truly in your corner and tell them. Right? Yes. If mm-hmm. you're a couple weeks away from marriage and you've got your intuition, go go have a therapy session. Like talk right. about it. Like you need to have those conversations mm-hmm. so that you don't enter into that sort of situation. With, right. But yeah. Also, no judgment there, if you do. Just, just FYI, no judgment if you do. No judgment to you, Alyssa, either. It's right. It's about. I just yeah. It's such an interesting topic. So you got married. Mm-hmm. And then you started to and see. I did. Yeah, it was good for about four days. <laughs> Everything okay. was fine. <laughs> the honeymoon uh, was short. It's apparent. Well, no, we were still on the honeymoon. Uh, the first four days were fine. And then we get to day five. We we had about, I think it was a six, six or seven day honeymoon. We get to day five and we're sitting in a movie theater waiting for a movie to start. And, um, and he looks over at me and he says something like, you know, I just, I can't remember his exact words, but he said something along the lines of, you know, I just, I just really want you to know that I'm just really enjoying having sex with you more than anybody else that I've ever slept with. Well, this was a problem for me because um, he had only told, he had told me that he had only ever slept with one person prior to being married. And for me, that was a hard enough thing for me to overcome. Like I really didn't like the idea of marrying someone who had been with anyone else. So when he made that comment, I was like, wait, what do you mean? Like you said, just this one other person. I said, how many others have there been? And you got to understand, like, I was a virgin when I got married. I've been married for five days. And I believed when I got married that he had only been with one other person. And he starts counting on his fingers. And he says, he looks at me and he goes, I don't know, I can't really remember there was a lot of vodka involved. But I think, I know it was over 10, maybe 12. I don't know, there was a lot of vodka involved. And I'll tell you what, like, talk about like my whole world coming crashing down around me because it wasn't so much the number. It wasn't even that he couldn't come up with a number. It was the fact that I had married him based on a belief and based on trusting him that he was telling me the truth about things that were very important to me only to find out on day five of our marriage that that was not at all the case. And his response to me being so upset about that was, well, I know I told you, you must have forgotten. And then begins the gaslighting because I can tell you something with absolute certainty. There is not a woman on the planet who is going to forget that her fiance has slept with a number of women in the teens. Mm -hmm. Like that's not something that we forget. And then the other component of it is the purity movement, right? And the, how absolutely important and imperative in our religious upbringing is the abstinence and remit, like just making sure that you're pure right? for your yes, husband and... or vice versa, because it's vice versa as well for all the yes. men that's listening. It goes for you as well, which clearly this man potentially lied to you about how much of a Christian he was as well, considering there was vodka and, <laughs> and it just a opens a women. whole it opens a whole can of worms, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. because all of a sudden, what else did he tell me that wasn't true? Right? He's not even admitting that he didn't tell me that in the first place. And then later that night, we get to the hotel. I'm still very upset, and his response to me after trying to tolerate my tears for a little while, his response to me is, "Well, the Bible says." We can't go to bed angry, so we need to have sex now. On day five. 
of our merch. And I'll tell you what, I I spent the next morning we left to to start driving back from Pennsylvania back to the Midwest and the whole way home. I'm thinking to myself, my job is still available. My apartment is still leased. All my furniture is still there. This is my car. Like, can I kick him out of the car and just go home? Because this is not what I signed up for. And again, I didn't have the the vocabulary to articulate what had just happened, but I knew, I, I mean, in that, that day I knew I was like, this is not going to go well. <laughs> like I have just signed up for something that I wasn't aware I was signing up for, but this is not good. And so and I there, didn't go ahead. Was there some, like, obviously not a very nice honeymoon. No. Right. I'm assuming throughout the 18 years, there were periods though, where you forgave him and leaned in, tried to sort of like mute your internal dialogue or your gut feeling or your unhappiness, maybe even tried to convince yourself that this could work. Did that happen? Yeah, absolutely. Probably the first seven or eight years, I really focused on trying to make the most of it, trying to believe the best, trying to work harder. I read marriage books. I read my Bible. We went to church. Like I put everything I had into trying to make this work because I, again, my, my whole perspective and, and belief system at that point was divorce is a sin. Mm -hmm. And here I am, so I might as well make the most of it, right? So yeah, there, there were, and there were times in those first years where things were pretty decent. Um, and it would last as long as it lasted, usually until I did something he didn't like. And then we were right back in that, like, and I had to dig myself out of that whole cycle of like, this sucks. <laughs> and, and I'm so stuck here. And how did I get here? And I would work my way back to look, trying to look at things positively and work a little harder and go out on a date and do, you know, but yes, it was, it was very much that cycle of, I'm going to keep trying everything I possibly can to make this work because I'm here and I'm stuck. But like, I get it in my mind. Like I can, I can see it happening. I already don't like this dude. Well, neither but... do I. So we have that in common too. So um and like i know that there are good men out there don't like i'm not a man hating person that's not the type of feminism i'm into but you know there's just some shitty men out there and i always think too that like they're probably shitty because they don't take accountability or reflect or like you know do the work right because there's work right. every person has to do but still i'm like it doesn't excuse the shittiness so like so for the first seven eight years you were you were committed to like making this work and going through the cycles mm -hmm. and then what happened next what happened next was that we moved overseas um ironically as missionaries things had been going pretty well at that point and um we were invited to go overseas to Bulgaria and to work with um, an organization that I had previously worked with before I got married. And um, so we did that. We raised support. We sold our house. We went overseas. And I, I went over really with very high hopes that uh, getting out of our daily routine and changing things up, being in a new environment would really help. But it actually had the opposite effect because um, we got over there and found out basically that the job that had been promised to my husband didn't exist. The job that had been promised to me didn't look like, like they had said it would look. And so within six weeks of being there, it became very clear that none of the reasons we had gone to serve overseas even existed. And, um, and so what happened is I adapted pretty quickly. I made friends. I found my own kind of made my own role so to speak so that I kept busy and I felt like I was there accomplishing something but my husband found himself without a job without anything to do he didn't know the language and I did he didn't know the city and I did and instead of getting outside of his own bubble and his own frustration he decided basically to sit in our apartment and stare at a TV and blame me 
for everything. And so we had two and a half years where he sat in our apartment day after day and watched TV and, and the rest of us lived our lives around him. And that's when a lot of his anger issues really started to surface and become big problems. So he would be watching TV and he would hear one of the kids mouth off to me and he would suddenly be in the middle of what was going on, but yelling and screaming at everybody rather than, you know, listening to what actually happened. And that was kind of the point where I was like, this, like, I can't leave because I'm in a foreign country. I'm dependent on support at this point, but man, this sucks. Like there, it, it turned a corner at that point where there was no good to, to see at least from, from where I was sitting and what the good things that had been part of our relationship before kind of all disappeared at once. And I was left with a husband who's not carrying his own weight in any way, shape or form kids to take care of in a foreign country. You can, you can keep adding to the pile, but that's when things really took a turn. And I was like, there's nothing here to, to salvage. Like there's nothing here to make anything out of. What do I even do with this? So you moved back home. We moved, um, we did after two and a half years. We moved back. In this state of beyond repair, essentially at this point. Yeah. I mean, I did find, I did kind of hope coming back. We, we moved back to the same city and town we had lived in. Um, he got his old job back. And so there was a little bit of hope that maybe if he got back in his routine around his friends and feeling like he had a job that was validating for him, that that would make mm -hmm. things better. But I don't, and it, it did maybe for a few months, but unfortunately at that point we had developed such unhealthy patterns that it, it just, it didn't last very long. And he got even more agitated and frustrated because coming back didn't make him feel better the way he thought it would. And so, you know, he then started to blame me for the move overseas because I took him away from everything he loved. And, you know, it just, it just continued to snowball rather than get better when we moved back. I do understand the disruption in his behavior while overseas. Like, I'm not, there's no excuse, right? But for men, because they don't really emote, and they've been taught to not emote, all of those things, to lose your purpose and to be isolated that way can just be like the most damaging thing in the world, right? Yes. Um, no excuse for it. And just to anybody who's listening, I'm not making excuses for him or anybody. I just like saying that I do understand that process of like getting in that funk and all of that stuff. It's unfortunate though, that coming back and like reestablishing your routines weren't able to improve him even like not, not even speaking of your marriage, but sort of like put him back in just a better mood period. Yeah. So I think at this point we're in, we're, we're at year what, 11, 12. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yep. We had baby number four shortly. Baby number three was born overseas. Okay. And then baby number four was born about a year after we got back. So now we have four kids. Yes. And okay. we're in about year 11 or 12, something like that. And when that? So we, we stayed in Indiana for okay. um, about two years. And then what happened was just in, the family dynamic was starting to change because my oldest two kids were preteens. My oldest one became a teenager and they really struggled with re-entry coming back from overseas as well they came back feeling like they were ready to just jump back into their old lives but all of their friends had moved on mm -hmm. and and so they which is normal and natural like that's that's how it works and they had changed more than they realized they had changed and so but both of them really had trouble finding new circles of friends and feeling like they fit in and the area where we lived was rural and there was not a lot of there were not a lot of opportunities for them to get involved in activities and, and extracurricular kind of things. So um, partially out of it, it, in an attempt to shake things up again and try to revitalize my marriage, but also to do what was best for my kids, I suggested 
to my husband one day that we moved to Texas. And, um, and the reason that I gave him was really for the kids. Um, because we, we homeschooled and in Texas, there's 10% of the population here homeschools. It's a very large homeschool community. And his response to me that day on the phone was absolutely not. No way. I got my job back. I'm, I like it here. Like, no, no way. So I just said, okay, all right, well, just think about it. You know, cause I knew at this point there was no, no point in arguing with him about it. And I kid you not three days later, three days, his, he had, um, he had just had a change in his boss. Um, they had just shifted around and he had a different boss. Three days later, his boss calls him into his office and completely rips him a new one about something that actually wasn't his fault and puts him on probation at work again for something that really wasn't his fault. And uh, he called me up and he said, so I, uh, within six weeks, I had lined up six interviews for him all in the same week. We came down, he did all the interviews. He was offered two different jobs. He picked one and 30 days later, we were, we were living in Texas and he got what he thought was his dream job. Like out of all the interviews I had lined up for him, there was one that he was really excited about. He landed that job and, and uh, so he was really excited initially about moving here. Uh, but then the dream job became the nightmare job. And for the next three years, he was in a job that he absolutely hated and he would come home and take it out on his family. And again, it was my fault. Like I had talked him into moving and, you know, it's just, you know, going all the way back to that story I told you about her honeymoon where he didn't take responsibility. And that really was the pattern through our whole marriage. Like every single thing to this day goes wrong is my fault. But he was miserable in this job for three years. Why didn't he try and find a different one? I think because he felt like he couldn't find one that paid as well. You know, he did get a significant pay raise coming, coming down here. And I honestly think he just didn't have the confidence to put himself out there and go find something else. And I tried to tell him, I was like, look, you know, if you have to take a little bit of a pay cut, we're going to be fine. Like go find a job that makes you happy. Um, but in his defense, I guess a little bit, I think he was a little stuck in his own rut mm -hmm. at that point. Sometimes we just being miserable gives us an excuse. Like if I think he was miserable in his job and that gave him a, an excuse or a, a justification for his behavior and for why he was so miserable. He could blame it all on the job and that meant it wasn't his fault. He didn't have to do any internal examination of what was really going on inside of him because he could blame it all on the job. It was all external. It was all external. Exactly. So what was the final name? Um, well, there were several things. Um, okay. In that time when he had that job where he was so miserable and he did end up getting another job um after three years which he still has to this day and, and loves um but he started to say things to me that were big enough problems that i actually had to acknowledge the fact that this is not okay um one of them was he he said to me one day he's like you know when i'm when you when you reject my advances and you don't want to have sex with me. I go to work the next morning and I, and I think about driving my car off a bridge because that's how it makes me feel. And so he got to the place where what he was saying to me, I could no longer ignore. Like even for, even for me, that kind of statement where if you don't want to have sex, I think about killing myself, that got my attention. Because that's, it's big, right? It's not, okay. there's no subtlety to that. And I started getting to a place where I had to like really start going, whoa, wait a minute. Like maybe I need to stop justifying this. Like maybe this isn't my fault. Maybe this really is not just a difficult relationship. Um, and I was listening to the radio one day. This is about two and a half years ago now. Uh, this whole process of waking up and realizing what was really going on took me several years. It was not an overnight realization mm -hmm. for me, but I was driving one day and I was listening to the radio and, um, 
my usual station was off the air for some inexplicable reason. And I was kind of scanning through. And I came across this woman who was talking about her marriage and uh, the challenges in her marriage. And it caught my attention because it was so similar to my situation. And I'm listening and she gets to the end of the interview and she says something about realizing that her marriage was abusive. And I went, wait, what? <laughs> like wow. I had never, ever considered that my marriage landed in that territory. But that really stuck with me because I couldn't get it out of my head. Like for months, I'm like, is this? No, 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 it's not that bad. And so finally, I made an appointment to see um, a counselor, a therapist. And I actually drove out of state to make this appointment to see this therapist because I did not want my husband to know that I was doing this because I knew there would be consequences, repercussions for me if he thought that I was sharing our problems with anybody. So I sit down with this therapist and I'm telling her my story and I'm about, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes into the appointment. And she says to me, almost the first thing she said in the entire conversation, she said, I want you to promise me something. And I'm like, what? She said, promise me that when you leave my office, your next call is going to be to the domestic violence shelter because they need to know who you are and you need to know who they are. And I was like, absolutely not. Like, he's never hit me. My marriage doesn't qualify. She's like, Alyssa, yes, it does. And I was like, no, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and she said, what you just described to me is 100% emotional and sexual abuse. And yes, you need a safety plan. And I, I mean, it took me weeks. I, I didn't call then. It took me weeks to wrap my head around that because I was so conditioned to just believe that every marriage was hard and that someday ours would get better. And if I just tried hard enough, I could figure this out. And having a licensed therapist look at me and tell me that was, that was really the beginning of my exit was that moment. It's interesting too, because I think a lot of people, when they think of abusive relationships, they always think about the physical component of it, but like the gaslighting, the manipulation, the verbal assault, the trying to guilt you into sex by making those statements, which we don't, I don't know if that's how he truly felt. But if he did feel this way, the issue wasn't you not having sex with him. Like he needed help of his own. Absolutely. Yes. The, the solution was not more sex. It never was. It never will be. Right. No. If he was feeling suicidal which he may have been i don't know if he was then like you said that's something that he needs help with that's not Absolutely. something that i can fix by having more sex so that was the beginning of your exit how did it unfold in a safe way well that was really tricky because after I saw that counselor, I saw a different counselor because I didn't believe her. The second counselor told me the same exact thing, almost. And so I started to try to figure out, okay, how can I leave? Because he was very violent in his rage and he would punch walls and do things like that. He never hit me or kid. Um, but I knew that the potential existed. Like I mm -hmm. knew if he's going to punch a wall, it could be me next time. And he, he had also become a lot mo more coercive in what he was saying um, to me and, and more direct, <laughs> more forceful. And it was, everything was escalating. And so I was like, how am I going to do this? And I joined a support group um, around that time for emotionally abused women. It's called Flying Free. And one of the coaches in there, I had some sessions with her. And one of the things that she said to me was she said, you know, a lot of the women in this group find that the safest way to leave is to just leave without warning, without conversation, without, you know, any kind of warning. And that was really hard for me because again, that kind of went against my upbringing of like how that felt sneaky, that felt dishonest, that felt disingenuous, like all these things. 
And she just said to me, Alyssa, like there can be conversations after you leave, but your primary responsibility is to get you and your, your kids out safely. And so, um, so I started looking at rental houses. I started working on building my business. I had my business, one of them already going, but I had only been working like 10 hours a week because he didn't like it when I worked when he was around it. So I started looking at rental houses and kind of just trying to wrap my head around how I could make this work. And the right around the time that I looked at the house that I ended up leasing and I was in that final, like I knew if I signed a lease, then I was committed. Right. That was the, that was in my mind, that was the thing that made the decision real. Right around that time, he hit one of my kids. And the minute that happened, I was like, I signed the lease the next morning because I guess that was the definitive, physical, undeniable, I can't justify this away kind of thing, you know? Um, And that was the moment I was like, I stood there and I was like, that's it. That's it. Well, it did escalate. Yeah. Into physical violence. So two weeks later, the kids and I moved out while he was at work. And um, I told him in an email that I had moved out. So, and looking back on it, in we've been separated now over a year. Well, we were just recently divorced. Looking back on it, that was absolutely the right thing for me to do. Because he has proven many times in the last year that telling him ahead of time would have been the wrong decision. So I have a question. Yes. I love that you're sharing your story, right? And, and I think so many people can benefit from hearing the story. Talking about it open, openly this way, can you do this safely? Yeah, I think so. Now we're divorced. He's seeing someone else. I'm not going to send him this podcast. <laughs> but I also... Uh, there's now enough distance and enough legal separation and enough boundaries. I've done a lot of work in the last year, really establishing boundaries. I've, I was not good in our marriage about establishing my own boundaries and sticking to them and enforcing them because there were consequences Mm -hmm. uh, when I was married, but now I've gotten a lot better about that. And um, so, yes, I think now I can, and I'm not, I'm not going to put his name out there. I'm not going to put my kid's name out there, names out there. Yeah. So I always think about those things, right? You know, we're talking about this. When we talk about it, women need to be able to talk about it. They, they, They have to be able to hear these stories. And my mind always goes to safety. Like, if this person was to happen on this particular podcast, see it. Are you and your family going to be safe? Would they take any steps to retaliate or any of that sort of thing? So that's where my concern comes from. That's all. I want to... So it sounds, though, to me, even after you left, you made you just made the comment that, you know, over the last year, he's exemplified why you made the right decision of just moving and leaving the email. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't sound like he's taken any steps to admit his part in this downward spiral of a marriage or no. the the emotional abuse or even f- the physical component of hitting one of the children. Um, and that's unfortunate for him, not yeah. for you, because at this point, I mean, I think it's unfortunate for the kids as well. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, but you've started... So you have left, you've created those boundaries, you're in a safe space, and you know the air date. Mm -hmm. So if you change your mind about this podcast, you can change your mind. I'm letting you know that because your safety is more important than... Oh, I appreciate that. But I I think... You're good. good You know better. I'm not the expert in your life. So I just want to make sure that you understand that it's there. Yes. Well, and, you know, the, the ironic thing is now that I have left, yeah, there's all this extra accountability for him. Because when we were married and everything that happened was in the privacy of our home, and I was never going to say anything because there would be such big consequences if I did. Mm-hmm. Now, one, he knows that I don't have any consequences. 
<laughs> for telling the truth anymore. There's nothing left that he can do to me to keep me in line because I'm not under his control anymore. And also when it comes to the kids, we now have court documents. We now have guardian ad litems. We now have all of these other people involved now where if he steps out of line, there it's are big be. consequences that don't come from me. And so, uh, or that would give me leverage to take away his time with the kids or things that he does not want. So there away. are immediate repercussions for him. Yes. He and it's good. very important to him. His reputation is very important to him. He's, he's keeps, he keeps saying to me over and over again, like, I was this exemplary husband and I did all these things and I'm a good guy and you're never going to find somebody as good as me. And I don't know what you thought you were going to accomplish by leaving me. Right. Uh, and he, so his, his reputation and how people see him is very important to him. And so he's very cautious about doing anything that might change how people see him. And that makes me happy. Being cognizant of time, what's your message to, well, before we, I ask you that, there was one, one piece of your form when you filled it out that really got my attention. And I want to read it. So you said, where is it? Now I am healing and thriving and dancing in the kitchen. Yes. There was a moment, I think it was about three months after I moved out, where I was in the kitchen making dinner and I'd put on music and my kids were in there. And we all just started having this dance party. And it hit me. That was the kind of thing that never happened in our home. Because I was attention. too stressed, because everybody was worried about what would happen when dad walked in, because of all these things. And that was the moment when I was, can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I can see that we've turned a corner, right? And joy is coming back into our lives. And not just mine, but my kids. Like, I can't even tell you how many people have commented on the change in my kids in the last year. Like, well, I can only imagine how freeing it is for them to not be sort of policed. Yeah. Or having to be so mindful of, like, the, the, any everything around someone who could be set off so easily. Exactly. Right? Yes. Um, I love that. I don't love that you had to experience 18 years of that. 20, really, if we think about the pre-marriage part of it. Um, for people listening, trust your gut. Absolutely. And even if you're not sure if you can trust your gut, at least book a therapy session. Have a conversation with a confidant. Like, talk about it. Because it's really important. Um, get help. You're the, th the first therapist and the second therapist was very right. Mm -hmm. If there is abuse, physical or not, reach out. Get a safety plan. You need it. It's your life and your kids' lives that yes. are important. Your message to anyone listening? Well, first and foremost, I would say, if you're in a relationship that is just beyond hard, if, it, if it's beyond, there's conflict, and it's in the territory of this is causing me pain every single day. <laughs> That is not okay. That's not just a hard relationship. And it's so easy, especially I think for women to get in this mindset of it's my job to make this work mm -hmm. and I can make this better somehow. But I would say to women, if you're in that situation where your relationship is causing you pain every day, that is not okay. And that is not something that you can fix all on your own. When I see women for coaching, I've recently started a, a coaching practice to, to coach women through difficult relationships. And what I like to say to them is if you feel unsafe, unseen, and unheard, do something about it. If you're unsafe, you're unseen, or you're unheard, that's not just a challenging relationship. Like A challenging relationship is we need to learn some better ways of communicating. Right. Mm -hmm. Or or we need to learn how to make up and repair when we have a fight. But being unsafe, unseen or unheard is a completely different thing. 
So find some help, find a coach, find a therapist, start with a best friend if that's the only place that you can start. Um, and the other thing is from the other side of things, from from the person who is watching a relationship, maybe it's your best friend or your family member, and you you have questions or concerns about their relationship. You know, since I left, I've had so many people say to me, some of my best friends have said to me, I really just had these concerns back 10 years ago. And I I don't know why I never said anything to you. <laughs> and that has floored me because I, I didn't realize that anybody was seeing anything, but they didn't say anything to me because they didn't want to offend me uh -huh. or they didn't want to cause problems in my relationship. And so if you are that person, I would say to you, find a way to reach out to that person and say something and maybe say something that doesn't require a response. Uh -huh. Like if, if any of those friends had said to me, you know, this and this happened and it kind of raised some red flags for me. And I just wanted you to know that I saw that and it wasn't okay. Right. What that would have said to me without requiring any response from me is if I need to talk, this is a safe person who's going to listen, who's going to believe me about what's really going on. Mm -hmm. So say something. And it doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be, hey, I think you're in an abusive relationship. <laughs> right? Don't do that. They may not be ready to hear that. But say something and let them know. I love that too, because I think if someone, and I like the way you said to line it up in like a way that they don't need to respond. It's when someone's in an abusive relationship for a long period of time, the abuser will do things to try and isolate and convince them that they're the problem or that it's all in their head. So nope. by someone externally recognizing a something that might have happened that didn't feel right, didn't sit well, and sort of just kind of bringing it up in a non-confrontational way, in a gentle way, is going to take them out of their head and be like, oh, you saw that? I thought that was just me. Right. And just like you said, it, it gives you the opportunity, that person who's ever in the abused relationship, the opportunity to recognize that this person's a safe state. Exactly. Because a lot of times when you're in these, for me, when I was in this relationship, I didn't feel like anybody was safe because I didn't know how they would respond, how they mm -hmm. would react. You know, most people looking at my marriage from the outside thought we had a great relationship, thought mm -hmm. everything was fine. And so... And I didn't know any different. I didn't know that anybody had seen red flags because no, nobody told me. And I think it would have helped me to open up a lot sooner if someone had shown me that they were going to be that safe person. The great message. If you're out there and any of this resonates with you or you recognize any of this in your relationship, reach out to someone and have a conversation. Uh, a therapist is always a safe space. but if it can't be a therapist, find someone yes. and get a safety plan. If you need one, your lives and your livelihood and your health are far more important than any single relationship. So make sure you take care of yourself. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for being on the show and talking about this. It's an uncomfortable topic to talk about, but it is one that needs to be spoken about often so that people can recognize signs and know that there is another side. Um, yes, yes. Everyone and, at home, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and my hope is that just like I was listening to that woman tell her story on the radio and it got my attention and changed my life, that this podcast will do that for someone the same way. So thank you so very too. much for, for having me. It was a really a privilege. Oh, the privilege was all mine. Um, thank you again for coming on and to everyone at home all to remember to tune in next week and be safe out there. All right. Until next time.